Hi class, um, this lecture I'm going to talk about a concept uh, called persistent object and also this will lead to naturally most of this is talk about homework assignment number six. So um, we have a look at this uh, what we call the post which allow uh, a group of people to exchange information, to show their reaction, to share what they um, feel about a certain topic. And this is a concept called POST, and you have developed, you work really hard to get uh, homework assignment number five to work to handle uh, a information entities, an object or representation like a POST. And in particularly, we know that we can represent this post using uh, a JSON format. So this is a JSON, but it's a JSON being used to represent each of the uh, attribute in a post, including the identity, including the the people who a person who involved in this post, including comments, reaction, as well as all the timestamp that we have. And potentially, like in homework assignment number six, uh, we're going to add in even more attribute. For example, we can add um, the locality of this post. Where did this happen? There was a location perspective, including that. Okay, but uh, what we really do uh, today, uh, what we really do did in homework assignment number five is this conversion uh, from uh, the, the conceptual post into a JSON representation. So I, I, I do want to say is JSON has a generic format. It can represent any kind of uh, structure or non-structured data. And while this particular format is a JSON, but it's a specialized JSON that we design to handle uh, a particular type of semantic uh, information such as a post. So this is this is what we have been doing um, uh, in homework assignment number five. We provide what we call a one-to-one -one mapping between a JSON post object and a C++ post object. So um, the thing is that I add the word called specialized and this is very important because um, we're not doing a generic translation or transformation from any JSON to a C++ object because that could be too broad and a lot of semantic information will not be captured through that. So what we did is I call a specialized one-to-one -one mapping, which is a JSON, but this JSON has a special structure. We're expecting certain field or certain key value pair must be there. And there are some flexibility, but overall we know this JSON uh, represent a post information. And then we create on the right-hand side of this slide that we have um, a number of classes what design which match into that. And most of them are actually a component from the biggest class called post. That's why we call it a post JSON because ultimately it's represent an object called post objects. So one JSON to one post object. When I say is one to one, there is certain property that we must uh, talk about. So one to one means that if I have a JSON and this JSON is representing a post, then basically it will convert it to uniquely one particular C++ post object. And then this C++ post object, when we actually convert it back to JSON, you should actually get exactly the same object. In other words, that if you have a multiple JSON representing post object, even though the arrangement are different, even though the bracket may be in different line, maybe some of them the style is somewhat alternate a little bit, but the content and the key value pair property are all the same. Then we're saying that they will all translate into a unique C++ post object. So that is a one 
to one mapping means that we can convert it from one side to the other and from the other side to here. Okay, so um, for doing this, um, um, this is in fact what we uh, try to capture the notion of this one-to-one -one mapping um, for homework assignment number five, uh, this is not in the reference implementation. This is an implementation I developed for both homework five and homework six that I have a two function that allow me to do this uh, bidirectional translation. Um, for example, um, from the C++ to JSON that we already talked about, you can use this uh, member function called post colon colon dump j and it will produce the JSON as you uh, expect. I really already know that how dumb J work. But the other side, which I haven't shown you up to this point, is called JSON to post. Means that you provide a JSON value pointer. And then from this JSON um, value pointer, I will actually convert that JSON into a pointer to a post object. So this is a, the other way. So the top JSON to post is from the JSON world to the C++ world, and the button is from the C++ world to the JSON world. So essentially, no matter how you're going to do either way, using this two function, you're going to get the same thing. And that is a one-to-one -one mapping that you have done. Uh, essentially, we're going to continue to develop this line. Um, I do want to mention is that uh, just an example um, that in homework sum number five, you spend a lot of time develop HW5 produce or HW5 merge, and it's, it's a pretty big chunk of code to handle each section. So essentially, JSON to post is actually cut the code from that part, a big chunk of code, into a function so I can actually use it again and again. Okay, that's, in fact, JSON to post is a very similar to the, to the program you develop in HW5 produced as well as HW5 merge. Okay, so as you can see, this, this is my version of uh, HW5 uh, produce that instead of going through this section by section, that after I parse the JSON from the input file, I directly just simply call JSON to post and it returned to me a pointer to the my post pointer. And then I just use dump J on that my uh, post um, pointer and then I will get back the JSON in the, in the, um, in, in the other direction, okay? So that's, that's uh, what we have done so far. There's two functionality to provide the one-to-one -one mapping. So now we're going to use this uh, very powerful but very simple uh, function as the interface to develop the next homework, which is homework assignment number six. Okay, one of the questions you might ask is when you work on the homework assignment number five, you have this one-to-one -one mapping, you know, okay, you can translate JSON to C++, you can translate C++ to JSON. What, what's the big deal about that? Okay, I do want to say number one, that that capability provide the number one we call object mobility. So what do I mean by object mobility? It means that, well, now I can actually move an object from one point in the internet to the other point. Because if I want to move a object from uh, Davis, California to New York, uh, what can I do? I can actually translate the local object, the post object, it's a specialized one-to-one. -one. And I can translate that into a post JSON. And then I move that JSON all the way to New York, a server in New York with IP address, with certain resource. And the server over there receive this JSON, and then what he can do is just call JSON to post, and that will give him a pointer to the post, now he can interact. So essentially what I'm doing is I either duplicate an object or move the object from one location to the other location. In fact, if you learn how to do this kind of conversion from whatever object you have, 
to the JSON format, you can actually apply to any kind of object-oriented programming language. You can do this with C++, but you can also can do it with Java or Python, for example. Okay, that's number one. That really allow us to do a lot of remote and uh, object mobility issue with this capability. Um, number two, there is a concept called persistent object, which um, um, I like to discuss with you because this is going to be really useful in real application. So, so far, all the objects that you have created in C++, once you, the program exit, uh, the object vanish. Basically, the program is already uh, put all the object in the memory, and therefore, if you're done, the program is done, then the object is done. You no longer need to have the object, no longer occupy any memory footprint, and that's gone. So, persistent object, works beyond that termination of the process. So what I want to do is that I write the program, I build an object, and I work on the object, I interact with objects such as a post. A post, as I mentioned to you, some of the posts can accumulate 400,000 comments. And you don't expect that within this 400,000 comments lifetime, there's no power outage. There's no server crash. There's no somebody want to just turn off the internet so they can take a flight. So there is a lot of uh, disruption to the lifetime of object much, much longer beyond the termination of the program or termination beyond a program running on your smartphone or cloud computing. It doesn't matter. And therefore, persistent object is essentially allow us to save it in a persistent storage. And later, when we want to continue, we will just bring that object back into uh, the memory, and then we can continue to access to that. So that's called persistent object. And with the, the conversion that you did in homework assignment number five, you actually already did that. Because what you can do, you probably realize that when you use StumpJ to create this uh, um, uh, to style string of this object representation. If you store that string in a file like here, I actually, uh, for example, this um, post object representing that particular ID, I can actually save that file as post underscore the object ID dot JSON and just save that style string. So now you can see that um, even though my program terminate, I would still have the file on my hard disk or on the cloud storage or somewhere else on the internet that has that information there with that file name. So now what you can do, next time you want to run the program, you just need to read that file in and using JSON to post. That function I showed you earlier, you convert it back to the uh, a C++ object or Python object, whatever you would like to do, and then you can continue. So this kind of save and the reload for the object in the JSON format. So in other words, what we are using JSON is using JSON to represent the data and its structure within an object that we're interested to make it persistent. Okay, so that is uh, the second thing you can really use this uh, um, uh, JSON um, object to implement persistent object. The third thing um, you can work on this uh, JSON is actually we can work on a, a, what, what I call either a JSON post browser or JSON post uh, uh, mobile app. So of course, you probably know that a lot of the internet environment that they will have a way to, for you to browse the, the JSON. But however, that's for generic JSON. It doesn't know that this is a post, this is a comment, this is a reaction. But what you can potentially develop is that you can develop a mobile apps that we're internally exchanging JSON to uh, sharing posts, to uh, click likes, or to provide comments on the, on the um, uh, discussion. But 
that is an internal format like your HTML, like your XML. And we can use this specialized uh, post browser to be able to enable us to develop application like a Facebook app. Okay, so that's another thing. We can use this as an internal data format, but also the nice thing about JSON is that we can actually provide extensibility semantics, which hopefully later I will show you uh, in this lecture as well. How can you extend that? Okay, the last part is really what I try to push you for both homework assignment number six and into homework assignment number seven, which is equivalent to the final exam of ECF36B is looking at what we just done into a uh, information ownership, trackability, privacy, and network propaganda issue. And uh, uh, for those of you who heard about the term called Cambridge Analytica, uh, that there was a very interesting movie called The Great Hack. And um, inside the movie, they were talking about the issue about well, my information has been collected, has been used, just like the way we're talking about here in JSON. And how do I know that this information is being collected, delivered, and applied to whatever application, such as a political uh, uh, event? And, and the thing is that this kind of tracking and also uh, sensitivity to the privacy and who owns what information really help us to look into this issue by examining the the, the post JSON uh, concept that we're dealing with. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to be more specific about what you're going to do in homework assignment number six. So in homework assignment number six is really between client and server. And of course, we're going to use the tool we know. This is called uh, JSON RPC C++, which you should be really familiar with through homework assignment number three. And what I have is that I, I provide ECS36B underscore HW6 uh, JSON, which is this JSON specify the two remote procedures that you're going to develop and implement on both sides and to facilitate uh, the concept in the, in the homework assignment number six. So let's take a closer look into this two function. This two function, one is called update, one is called search. And the update function take one parameter, which is a JSON. And search also take one parameter, which is JSON. So we're using JSON to specify the remote procedure call, and yet we use JSON format, the, especially the post JSON format, to represent the argument that we're going to passing through this remote procedure call. So we're going to first talk about the update. Okay, so what is the update? Okay, you can see on this slide that uh, on the left hand side we have the client. Client has a has an update. Okay, here it is actually a post. The post I showed you earlier that somebody wants to share some content and already have some friends of him. At this point, when the client have this, is already have a main article, which is the post message, but also have a couple comments and also have a number of um, uh, reaction. You can think about this post is equivalent to uh, base input dot JSON that you have. Okay, on the other side, we have a server. So in this case, the server doesn't have any object yet. So the client is going to call the update uh, J, uh, update uh, function through um, uh, JSON RPC, and it take only one parameter, which is a JSON underscore string. And how do I get that JSON underscore string? As I mentioned, there are two functions. I'm going to use dump j to do that. Post colon colon dump j from the post object, I will be able to produce the JSON string for me to send it to the server side. And of course, on the server side, I have another function called JSON to post because I received this string from the client. And then I will parse the JSON. And then by using this particular function, 
I showed you earlier called JSON to post, which will convert that JSON string back to uh, the post uh, object pointer. So after I done this, what I have, now you see that I have a footprint of the same post on both client and the server. And also important is that this particular post has a identity. This is always important to know when you create a post object, you have to have identity. And the, the, the red letter, the yellow box on the top is the object identity of this particular post. It's a post ID. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to move into the persistent object a little bit. So I'm a server. Server will crash anytime. I want to keep tracking what is the newest value about the post. So I don't know when my server will crash. And therefore, I'm going to call from the server side, I'm going to call post dump j on the server side. And then I generate the JSON format, and then I just store that into a file. And the file name I listed here is the post underscore the identity, the object ID, the post ID, sorry, of this uh, post, and then dot JSON. Okay, so you can see that this is a post that was object format from the client. They moved to the server side in the JSON format. And the JSON format converted to C++, extract the ID of the, of the post, and use that ID as a file name, and then create the post underscore whatever the ID dot JSON, and save that JSON string in there. So now you can see that we not only converted the object from one side to the other, but we actually have a persistent object, because anytime now the server crash, I still have that post in the, in the file on the server. I can continue to, to work on that, okay? So after this is done, after this is done, the, the call of the update function will reply an acknowledgement to the client. This is just follow the, um, the JSON RPC protocol. When you make a remote procedure call, you're gonna receive something back. And that return something back is also a JSON. So essentially, um, when you send the object over there with a JSON string, so the server is going to reconstruct using JSON to post, and from the post, it's going to reconstruct the JSON, and the JSON is going to send back to the client. For this simple example, you might feel, oh, that's a lot of redundancy. Yes, it's a redundant but we'll see that there was something more interesting that will happen in the next example. But at least the client can check whether the, the JSON post I send over there to the server is equivalent to the JSON post I received. If they are equivalent, means that at least my update has been effective into the server. Okay, so that is an example of uh, the first example about update that how you can actually use update to upload your, your local post into the server and the server could change that into a persistent object that this post can continue after either the client or the server crash. Whenever they recover, you can continue to have that discussion. Okay, so that is the first example. Okay, now I'm going to go through a second example. Assuming that this is an existing post, that I'm actually introduce a new comment, a comment that I've never seen before, that after somebody uh, shared this post and now we have a new comment coming in, okay? So we have this picture looks like this right now. So you can see that the server already have a post now the client has a post that was a new comment. And of course, for those of you who just finished homework assignment number five, you know this is a perfect scenario for merge, right? Okay, great. Yes, you're exactly right. We're going to use merge, but I'm going to do a little bit uh, different this way. So assuming I already have the file, 
uh, that's actually um, um, on the JSON because I saved it. So what I can do is that assuming the, the, the object is not in my memory, so when I receive that JSON update, which is really the update with the same identity, but it's a new comment or new like or new element in the post, people want to merge into the new JSON. But there's one element must exist is the identity of the post. So I extract the identity from the JSON string I just received, and then I use the identity to retrieve the latest version of the file that we actually saved earlier. So I'm going to reload that file from the file, and then using this program called JSON to post, you see I'm keep using this two program, dumpj and the JSON to post. It's because this conversion is so powerful, so useful for me to play around with the information. So after I read the file, just like pretty much you read the file from your HW5 produce, um, I will construct the post star, which is the pointer to the post object. And now I have this picture. On the left-hand side, I have an update, which already been sent to the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, currently, I have the update. OK, so now I'm going to apply. Again, I'm going to apply uh, JSON to post for the object that I just received from the client side. And you can see that now I'm actually have a two object. One object is the, is the original one. I just reloaded from the file. And the other one, I'm actually getting it from the, um, from the client. So of course, this is a perfect example for us to do the merge. OK, so now I'm going to introduce a third function, which um, you Develop something equivalent. Now I'm actually going to call it called merge posts. So what is a merge post? Merge posts take a two parameter, two argument. The first argument is a post, means that this is the original post that is needs update from the second argument, which is the uh, JSON value star. So essentially what we're looking at is that the one I reloaded from the file is going to be converted into a post pointer. And the JSON string I just received from the client, which is update, is going to load it in as a pointer to JSON value. OK, so that is, if you think about how you implement the HW5 merge, that's exactly the two pieces of information you need to merge these two things together, given that they share the same uh, post ID. OK, all right, so after you've done this, after you've done this update, now you can see that now I have a new object, that this new object has all the new element, not just the original one, has a new element. So once it's done, every time an update is done, one thing must be done is that you will update the JSON file. So you will write it back to that post underscore the post ID dot JSON file such that that JSON file will persistently keep the most update information about this file on the server. OK, right now we're assuming we only have one server. I mean, later, later means that after ECF36B, that you can think about in a distributed system, you're going to have a multiple copy of the, the same uh, object, and that will trigger some other interesting uh, challenge. But um, but I can tell you that if you know how to do one, that will give you a lot of leeway to really di build a distributed system based on the same concept. Okay, so we have a one copy, and then every time you have a new update, and you have that. Okay, all right. So the final step about the update, just like I show you in the early example. And now what you have to do in the acknowledgement of this update, you're going to send this uh, acknowledgement with the dump J from the newer, newest form, the JSON. So essentially, this is a place that the client, even though he only have a very older version of the post with just one new comment, and now the client, maybe he's going to receiving a much, much larger post with not just 
his or her own update, but also remember the server is the entity that's actually going to collecting update from everywhere. Anybody who is interested in this post, you're going to gather your, um, your, your interest, your update, your comment, your reaction into this growing uh, JSON that representing this particular post. And now as acknowledgement, the whole post is going to be sent back to the client. Now the client will also receive that bigger growing JSON. And then they can do, they can understand not just about his own comment, he can understand there might be new comment or new reaction or new element in the post that he needs to know. And that's, that's exactly the update is trying to do. So the update, in fact, is not just update the server, but it's also update the client. And you can imagine that this call update, if it's keep calling among all the entity in the internet, then it will enable the communication among all of us, okay? All right, so what we just did is that we create, we update, and merge, and then we provide persistency. And the one last thing about persistency that after the client receive uh, from the, um, the acknowledgement of one update, the client also will call dumpj uh, locally, and then it will also create a local copy over here. We will talk about this local copy because in the bonus part of homework number six, that we're going to use this capability as well. Okay, so that's a quick uh, go over about what is the first RPC function that you need to implement and exercise to for homework assignment number six is called update. All right, I mean update conceptually may be interesting, but in terms of programming, it will use reuse a lot from your both homework assignment number three and homework sum number five, okay? All right, so I'm going to do the second homework, the second function. The second function is a search. And uh, it takes one parameter we call the search uh, clause. Okay, so what's a search? A search looks like this. Now we have a client server that you can see that the client currently, I have a no object, and maybe the client is a JSON post browser means that I have a mobile app. I want to see what's, what's going on in the world. I want to see what, what my community is doing about coronavirus. I want to know what's the result of NBA Balkan and people's reaction to this, uh, uh, the final five minutes about a particular player. Okay, so now I'm empty. I want to search through the server and the, why is a server? The server is not just keeping one JSON. The server is keep all the posts, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe billion or trillion posts. Like today's Facebook, it's just people just keep injecting uh, posts into this gigantic infrastructure to allow people to retrieve information they are interested. So therefore, what we want is that we would like to have the capability to be able to specify, to tell the server what we would like to get from the, from the post, okay? All right, so one of the idea about the post is the keyword. So what is the keyword? I can actually, uh, um, uh, specify in the search clause when I send from the client to the server that um, I specify some kind of keyword is, is a phrase. And, and the thing is on the server side, it has currently listed here on the slide, it has 12 uh, posts and only two of them have this particular uh, keyword, okay? so the return, the acknowledgement or return of this call search is basically return an array of posts, JSONs. And each element in the array represents one post. So in this case, it will return two of the posts. So let me just repeat this very quickly, is that we specify the keyword 
and the keyword will get matched against all the JSON that currently the server have. And the server will return an array of JSON, which is still a JSON, which each of the elements in the array represent a post. Of course, what this means that is we have to make some modification to the data structure we already have. And for example, this is a data structure you, uh, if you, if you use the, the reference implementation, that is the code you have been using, which shows all the elements that for that um, object post. But now we're going to add in one extra keyword. That this keyword is also a vector. Uh, I call it O key or OK, O key. And uh, the, the parameter is called keys. So keys is a, a vector of the keyword phrases. For example, uh, the, the example I use, the, the key phrase is uh, Patrick Jane, and that will be one of the element in the vector. So basically every post, when you do the update, ah, I forgot to mention, that how do you actually insert the key using update? So when I decide to create a post, I can actually add a few keywords to that, uh, to that post. And everybody who knows about this post, they can also add this keyword into that. Okay, so that's the new um, uh, element that you need to add to the class post in order to support this, this concept. Okay, so, um, so now you know how to do this search is sending the keyword, getting a sequence of posts back. But for the, that, that's for the basic one, but you can do some bonus. So with the bonus that instead of search for keyword, you can actually search for distance. For example, I'm interested in all the posts that related to the GPS location. By the way, that GPS location, 38.5 and minus 121.7 is the GPS of Davis. I'm interested in within certain distance, for example, here is 100 miles around uh, Davis. I want to see all the posts uh, related to that. Okay, or I can say, I want to get the newest tie or the tie about certain timestamps. So I can say, if you have any um, uh, post that's actually after, fresher than the, the update time of May 2nd uh, in the afternoon. Okay, that's your first bonus that you can actually uh, enhance your search capability to include other feature to allow you to narrow down your filter about what information you're really interested in. Okay. So now there's another case that, well, you have a client and the server, and of course server has a lot of other things, but the internet disconnect or the SSH tunnel get teared down or the firewall suddenly uh, is not being friendly or your server just crash. But the thing is that you want to continue to use this post. When I say continue to use this post is that you don't have to go to the server, but in your dormitory, there is other uh, 33 students who might be interested in this post they want to discuss. So even though you are serverless, but this client can serve as the server. And how do you actually handle that? So that's what's the second bonus I want you to do. So essentially the client program need to do is that I'm going to artificially, when I test your program, I'm going to artificially disconnect the connection between client and server. Maybe I just use control C to kill the server and such that the server suddenly die. And your client program is going to use this exceptional handling clauses to keep tracking whether the server came back in life. And at the same time, you still interact with other update. And the thing is that what you have is this situation that whenever there's a new update, say your roommate actually make a comment about this post. I mean, you, you're, you're disconnect from the server, but your roommate still give you a new update. So what you can do is you can actually call merge posts from your local client to merge the new input from your roommate and you and then you can actually 
put it in your local file. So that's why you actually also keep a local copy on your client machine. And then when the server is back, then you can actually upload the aggregate merge of the whole thing back to the server. So essentially what we are saying is that when you got quarantine, social distancing, you cannot go to the server for some reason, but you can still have your local gathering. You are collecting all the information. When the door reopen again, now you're going to use the update protocol to update the whole thing. But your client program need to be robust enough to know that even though the server is not available, the client will still be able to continue to operate. So that's what we wanted you to uh, demonstrate and implement in bonus number two. Okay, so we basically went over that this two function, one is uh, update, one is a search, and together with the three function we already talked about, one is called dump j, one is called JSON to post, and the other one is called merge post, which is two remote procedure call, and that three functions to support this two, you can imagine you can do a lot of interesting thing with that. Okay, so now I'm going to add another thing yet yeah, into this. This is going to be interesting. Is that, well, when you do a search on the keywords that you're looking for, or you're searching for some post related to uh, locality, so the server is going to send you two of the posts. And the thing is that what you want to do is assuming, now you see that I put a user entity, Oracle, by the way, is the avatar name, for my VSID, okay? So this is my VSID. I'm actually representing Oracle. So in other words, that this particular picture is actually tracking that not just I submit the keyword to obtain this post, but also I can associate this VSID with this two posts I received. In other words, that this is potentially recording what information has been delivered to me at this time. Okay, so essentially what we like to record is that, okay, can we actually just keep tracking that which VSID that received this post? For, for example, in homework assignment number seven, I want you to do is that you want to create a few uh, posts and you want to know that at least certain numbers, say that number is 50 students, that there are 50 students already being delivered about this post. So how do I actually even keep track of that? That is you using this append information to add to that. So essentially this is the whole scenario I was, I was talking about is that, okay, here we're assuming you're willing to uh, append this information. By the way, who's going to append that information is on the client side. So essentially this is uh, voluntary. If the client side decide, no, I want to keep my privacy. I don't want people to know I actually ever read this particular post, I won't append. But on the other hand, if I want people to know my interest, I want to know that I'm the information, I'm once upon a time that I'm actually on the information propagation path, then I can append append my uh, um, VSID or Oracle and what time, uh, or what GPS, I can add it to that, okay? So, okay, let's summarize what we just talked about in terms of this uh, scenario about adding, appending those uh, tracking information. So again, that we have this person object, which was a VSID, with an avatar name, is the one who actually represents who is on the side of the client interacting with the server. So we want to bring the people who access the information together with the information access itself. So when the posts are being delivered to the Oracle side, which is the client side, that is the person's decision to say whether I want to append the traceability information into this post. If 
that's being done, then essentially you're going to send another update message over to the server side, which now the update will include the new appended information, which I talk about extensibility about this paradigm. And you can really extend to include those interesting information. And after you've done that on the server side, the server is going to gather information, not just from Oracle, but from other VSID in our class. And then that result is going to be a very uh, extensive information, not about the post, but also about what VSID the post have been delivered into. And that whole ball of JSON still represent one post is going to be sent back to the client, each of the client, for them to actually take a look at who actually have read this particular uh, JSON. In fact, I think it's very useful. Um, for example, I want to make an announcement to everybody in the class. Like uh, last night, I was telling people about uh, there's a new policy change about the grading in the spring quarter of 2020. I really like to get a confirmation because I know that information will be very important for some of the students who might want to leverage that option that uniquely uh, happened this quarter because of the coronavirus. And I like to know whether people have received it. And how do I know that in this kind of group setting with a large number, by appending this information, by retrieving the update about that list, it enabled me to actually realize that at least this information has been delivered to uh, the people I thought it should deliver to. So in this sense that I'm the author, I'm the creator, or I'm the participant, I will have shared this kind of information that might be useful for me to do a uh, certain follow-up. And again, because of that, now I need to introduce another uh, attribute to my class post. So now my uh, class post has another, I call a transaction. And the transaction essentially keep the history about transaction basically contain the people who are actually involved in the time and the GPS location who actually receive this particular post. So now I have another uh, object for me to do that. Okay, and so essentially what, what we have done over here is that I provide a way for me to propagate the information, but I can also tracking the information about how this information, how is the propagation is being successful, is being popular, is being nobody care, and this kind of information platform you can imagine that it can apply to a lot of application today. And one of the things I didn't talk about, I mentioned a little bit is about privacy. In fact, uh, I should uh, argue is that while we really care about privacy, but usually we talk about privacy is about preventing certain information get leak out. And this model, in fact, it lead to another side of privacy. It's that at least I know what information has been read by who. And it's not a black box, it's the transparency about the privacy situation. Okay, so this is what uh, we talk about today. Even though I mainly talk about homework assignment number six, which you can see now, is actually try to build that from the first homework to uh, the last uh, formal homework that you need to work on. It really uh, has a lot of usability and it really uh, touch a lot of concept, especially the fourth bullet I put here about information ownership, trackability, uh, privacy, and network propaganda. Okay, so I hope you uh, uh, understand a little bit about uh, homework assignment number six and look at the specification. Um, um, I hope you enjoy doing this and you will learn a lot. Okay, I will see you tomorrow.